Good afternoon to everyone from the US Department of State's Africa Regional Media Hub. I would like to welcome our participants from across the continent and thank all of you for taking part in this discussion. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by the Deputy Administrator for Policy and Programming at the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, Isabel Coleman, and Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia at USAID, Erin Elizabeth McKee. Our speakers will discuss the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the impact of its collapse has had on, Russia, on uh, Africa, and the United States effort to strengthen food systems on the continent. Deputy Administrator Coleman and Assistant Administrator McKee are joining us from Washington, DC. We will begin today's call with opening remarks from Deputy Administrator Coleman and Assistant Administrator McKee. Then we will turn to your questions. We will try to get to as many of them as we can during the time that we have. At any point during the briefing, if you would like to ask a question live, please indicate that by clicking on the raise hand button and then typing your name, media outlet, and location into the question and answers tab. Alternatively, you can type your full question directly into the Q&A for me to read to our speakers. Again, please include your name, media outlet, and location when you do so. If you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, please use the hashtag AF Hub Press and follow us on Twitter at Africa Media Hub. As a reminder, today's briefing is on the record. And with that, I will turn it over to Deputy Administrator Coleman for opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you to everyone for joining us uh, this morning here in Washington uh, to talk about the impacts on global food security since Russia's invasion of Ukraine its recent decision to abandon the Black Sea Grain Initiative and its clear intent to destroy Ukraine's agricultural capacities. Russia's purposeful destruction of Ukraine's breadbasket is impacting not only Ukrainian farmers, but also those around the world who rely on Ukraine's exports. The Kremlin continues to spread lies about the Black Sea Grain Initiative while reaping record profits from exporting agricultural products. False narratives spread by the Kremlin conveniently forget that the US and the EU, our sanctions do not target in any way trade and agricultural and food products between third countries and Russia. And the Kremlin's expanded military aggression against Ukraine, including the devastation abroad, to Ukrainian farming sectors has triggered the sanctions in the first place. Putin has claimed that Ukrainian exports from the Black Sea benefit the richest countries and not the poorest. This is simply a lie. In fact, nearly two thirds of Ukraine's wheat exports through the Black Sea Grain Initiative have gone to developing countries and almost 20% have gone to the very least developed countries. Every spike in global grain prices, every wasted harvest increases the risk of another parent who cannot feed their child. Just in the last few weeks, since pulling out of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the government of Ukraine estimates that Putin's missiles and drone attacks have destroyed 180,000 metric tons of Ukrainian grains sitting in storage. That is sufficient grain rations to feed almost 12 million people for a month. From August of 22, when the first ship departed under the Black Sea Grain Initiative through its termination uh, last month on July 17th, Ukraine shipped nearly 33 million metric tons of desperately needed grain and oil seeds to global markets through the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And Putin's refusal to continue this life-saving deal is hurting the world, which depends on Ukrainian grain. Since the beginning of this war, he has used food as a weapon of war. And now he's made clear that he's not only intent on trying to cause mass devastation in Ukraine, but also around the world. In Africa, in the Middle East and elsewhere where people depend on Ukrainian food to feed their families. We have to remember that all of the food exported from Ukraine serves a critical role for the world's poor, even if it doesn't go directly to food insecure areas because it calms markets and mitigates against price spikes in key commodities. USAID is working to address the global food security crisis that has been exacerbated by Putin's brutal and unprovoked war on Ukraine. Since February of last year, USAID has committed more than $14 billion 
in humanitarian and development assistance in more than 47 countries. And today at the UN Security Council, Secretary Blinken will announce $362 million in additional humanitarian assistance through USAID for countries facing severe food insecurity, which has been exacerbated by Russia's war on Ukraine and Russia's withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Our stance has always been clear. We want as much food on the global market as possible, and we want it to be sold at the lowest price as possible. And while the, and while the world is, what the world absolutely needs is for Russia to end its illegal war against Ukraine, which would allow for a return to normal agricultural production and trade. I want to underscore that the United States is committed to responding to humanitarian needs and providing life-saving aid in response to the historic food security crisis, while also investing in resilient food systems. Food security was an important issue highlighted by President Biden at the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit and is a focus of USAID's work in Africa. So I'm going to pause there and hand over to Erin McKee, who leads our Bureau for uh, Europe and Eurasia. So Erin, over to you. Thank you, Deputy Administrator, and thank you everybody for joining us uh, today. Uh, just, just under two weeks ago, I was standing in the port of Odessa, accompanying uh, USAID's Administrator Samantha Power on her second trip into Ukraine. Before Russia's full-scale invasion last February, Odessa felt like the very center of life. It was Ukraine's gateway to the world. And every day there was a spirited bustle as Ukraine's precious gold, that is its grain, went from Odessa to feed the world. As Deputy Administrator Coleman mentioned, the Black Sea Grain Initiative allowed Ukraine to export nearly 33 million metric tons of grain and oil seeds, resulting in life-saving impacts on countries experiencing acute food insecurity. In early July, Russia began blocking ships from entering this port. And on July 17th, Putin made the dangerous decision to end Russia's participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative, cutting off a vital lifeline for global food security. On the night of July 18th, only hours after Administrator Power and I left the port, Russia launched intense missile barrages on Odessa and surrounding ports to degrade Ukraine's critical Black Sea Grain export infrastructure and as we returned to Kyiv on the overnight train, our phone sounded alarms loudly every couple of hours, a constant reminder of the physical threat of Russia's aggression in Ukraine. But at the same time, Russia threatened commercial navigation with attack, stating that henceforth, all ships bound for Ukrainian ports would be considered military targets. USAID is committed to, support, to helping support Ukraine in light of this latest act of Russian aggression. We are working to accelerate livelihoods and alternative methods to get Ukraine's grain out and to the markets that need it. We are also continuously engaging our allies and partners to ensure that Ukraine's, uh, Ukrainian <laughs> grain and food exports, which are so crucial to Ukraine's economy and global food security, we need to get them to global markets. Over the course of the last year, working with Ukrainians and partner countries, we've seen these alternative routes via the Danube, via road, via rail, go from exporting roughly 3 million metric tons of commodities each year to roughly 3 million metric tons exported each month. And despite the significant progress to open up and expand alternative export routes, it is essential that Ukrainian food is able to ship out of Black Sea ports. That outlet, that window to the world will never uh, be uh, compensated for the overland routes that we are working so hard on. These alternate routes will not be able to absorb the Black Sea Green Initiative's full capacity and may receive lower earnings as alternative export routes can actually be more costly. On July 18th, on that same trip to Odessa, we announced an additional $250 million in new funding for our flagship Agricultural Resilience Initiative in Ukraine. This funding is in addition to the $100 million that USAID, USAID announced last July of 2022 to initiate the Agricultural Resilience Initiative. And so with these new funds, we will build on the work that we have been doing in partnership with the Ukrainian government and our allies, with the transport and logistics industry and with Ukrainian farmers. We'll upgrade critical infrastructure for, for rail and road transportation 
and we have a collective interest together to ensure that access to inputs, seeds, fertilizers, and other critical elements for Ukraine's agricultural sector will be available so that Ukrainian farmers can stay in business. We're helping farmers in the agricultural sector deal with the urgent implications of Putin's aggression. And this is an investment, not just in the aggression, but Ukraine's long-term future in the breadbasket that will help feed hungry communi communities around the world, including many in Africa for generations to come. Putin's unprovoked war of aggression has created a monumental challenge, but a generational opportunity, not just related to food security. It's an historic inflection point and one that we wanna tackle and make sure that Ukraine can continue to not only uh, restore its economy and restore its sovereignty, but also continue to help feed the world. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Administrator Coleman and Assistant Administrator McKee. We will now begin the question and answer portion of today's call. For those asking questions, please indicate if you would like to ask a question live and type your name, location, and affiliation into the question and answers tab. We ask that you limit yourself to one question related to the topic of today's briefing, which is food security in Africa. Our first question will go to uh, Mr. Joe Bavier of Reuters, based here in South Africa. He asks, while the Black Sea Grain Initiative appeared to succeed in bringing down global grain prices, Russian President Putin is correct when he points to the fact that only a small fraction of grain exported under the arrangement was shipped to developing countries, including in Africa. If renewed, would the US be in favor of creating mechanisms that would ensure that more grain is sent to Africa? And if so, how might that be done? Um, Mr. Bavier, thank you for your question. Although I, I'm not sure um, where uh, you are able to fact check that Mr. Putin is correct. Um, the UN's own uh, data indicates that as I said in my opening comments, 65% of the grains from the Black Sea Grain Initiative have gone to developing countries and 20% have gone directly to the least developed countries. Um, it, it, it's, just, it's just a not true statement that developing countries haven't benefited from the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And the other point that I also made in my opening comments, which is very, very important to, to keep in mind is that countries that import grains, um, those grains are global commodities and they are priced globally. Um, and taking off from the market, uh, one of the world's largest bread baskets, Ukraine, uh, by doing that, Russia is increasing global food prices. We've seen already how when the Black Sea Grain Initiative deal came into place, global food prices came down over time. And since Russia has pulled out of the agreement, uh, food prices have um, again been on the rise. And this affects every country around the world, but it affects most acutely um, large importing developing countries that have to spend much more of their precious foreign exchange resources to purchase food to feed their populations. So it is just patently untrue, uh, Putin's statement, that this deal has not benefited developing countries. It, develop, it, it benefits developing countries uh, really the most because they are spending um, a larger share of their foreign exchange earnings on importing food um, than developed countries. So, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I would say that this is one of the, the false narratives that Putin has, has pushed repeatedly and it is just a patent lie. Thank you. Our next question will go live to Pearl Matibe, Matibe writing for Premium Times in Nigeria. Can you open the line, please? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tiffany. Good morning uh, to you and good morning to the briefers. I appreciate your time. Um, I do have my own question, but I also want to just emphasize on the response that uh, Deputy Administrator just made. Um, if, if you would please be more precise. I understand the point you're trying to make, but you've got to be more precise as opposed to developing countries is still a broad term. You've got to be precise about the percentages that are exactly going to which African countries. My, my question to you is this. 
It seems that each African country that attended the Russia-Africa summit is interpreting it as a success for their country. But what is the success for Africa? So again, I'm asking you to be precise about percentages, give us data, which countries precisely. And I heard you say in your opening remarks about that, but, um, uh, shipments would be attacked and would be military targets. Could you elaborate on what you meant about uh, ships being military targets? And I'd like to hear from both of you. Thank you very much. So, um, Pearl, we can follow up um, with the data that you're asking for. The UN has published that data um, that has shown uh, which countries are importing the most. Um, but we do know that, as I said, 65% has gone to developing countries. You are correct, that is a broad spectrum, but 20% has gone to um, the least developed countries. And so um, you will see that there are a number of countries that are quite dependent on importing Ukrainian grain and have been for you know, many years, they, they have relied on that. Um, the World Food Program has um, over the years, um, prior to the war and, and even last year has continued to source about 80% of its wheat from Ukraine. And, and this is going to some of the, the most vulnerable countries in the world, uh, Yemen, Afghanistan, Somalia, um, and so Ethiopia. I mean, around the world, you've seen um, Ukrainian grain be uh, priced um, uh, very, very competitively and uh, shipping routes out of the Black Sea um, through the Suez Canal uh, to, to the Horn of Africa and to uh, South Asia, you know, has been a cost-effective way to move grains to those places. So um, please um, uh, recognize that this grain has been supporting some of the, the very most vulnerable people in the world. Um, and then please don't lose sight of the fact that Ukraine is one of the world's breadbaskets, has uh, been an important contributor to global food security. Um, it is a global commodity, it is priced globally, and every um, increase, every percentage increase in food prices affects the most vulnerable the most. So um, yes, a portion of it is going directly to um, uh, developing countries, but Ukrainian grain and, and, and wheat is it's just an important component of the global food supply regardless. Thank you. And Pearl, to answer your question or to respond to your question about Russian attacks on uh, vessels, uh, beginning as of July 18th, my comment in my opening remarks was related to or was repeating specifically what the Kremlin announced, which was that henceforth all ships bound for Ukrainian ports would be considered military targets. In the last nine days, uh, 26 port infrastructure facilities have been hit by the Russians. Five civilian vessels, civilian vessels have been hit by the Russians and 180,000 tons of precious grain crops have been destroyed. Thank you both. Um, if I could just uh, ask the journalists, I do see a lot of uh, commentary in the uh, webinar chat. If you could please put that in the Q&A, um, that's where the questions should be lodged. Um, uh, that's where they'll be read from. So uh, thank you. With that, I will go uh, to one more question submitted in advance from Mr. Tamo Kabisa from SABC Channel Africa in South Africa who writes, no priority is more pressing than addressing food insecurity to safeguard the calorie and nutritional needs of Africa's 1 billion people and protect their human development. What long-term actions are being taken to cushion the blow of the current crisis on the poorest households and set African food systems on a more resilient and productive pathway? Uh, thank you. I'll take that question. And thank you so much for that question, um, because this really gets right at the heart of what USAID does. Um, in the wake of the last food crisis uh, that rocked uh, global food security back in 2008, 2009, 2010, 
Um, in response, uh, the US government launched Feed the Future, which is a whole of US government approach to invest in food security and making countries more resilient to food crises. And today we invest in more than 40 countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and really around the world. And we have 20, <coughs> sorry, 20 target countries that have very high levels of poverty and hunger and also a strong potential for agriculture to drive economic growth and to transform food systems. So the investments that we have been making have been in um, improving soil health and improving um, uh, seeds quality, um, getting inputs to farmers, um, training farmers on modern agricultural techniques so that they can um, be more productive, that they can have higher yields while using less fertilizer, putting new technologies into their hands and training and specifically focusing on, on women farmers who make up an increasingly large portion of, um, of farmers and agricultural production, but operate at lower productivity levels for a whole variety of reasons. So really focused on targeting, uh, raising women's productivity. Um, and um, we've seen uh, some very significant um, uh, productivity improvements, um, and it's been able to crowd in more resources from the private sector. Um, it has reached uh, more than 30 million people, and, um, and we've seen reductions in poverty and increases in agricultural production. So um, I would go so far as to say that some of the worst effects of this fruit crisis have been mitigated by the investments we've made over the past more than decade in food security, in long-term food security around the world. And of course, we also are constantly um, responding to the nutritional needs of people who are facing um, uh, crisis situations with humanitarian response. Um, we've uh, significantly increased our investment in ready-to-use therapeutic food um, uh, and announced a big commitment at UNGA last year uh, to increase um, access to uh, ready-to-use therapeutic food, RUTF, uh, to treat many, many more people who are facing uh, nutritional crises. But that's a, a short-term uh, response, but the long-term response has really been investing in that long-term agricultural capability of farmers around the world and specifically in Africa. Thank you. Thanks, I'd like to go to Peter Fabricius of Daily Maverick for the next question. Can you open the line, please? Hi, thanks very much, Tiffany, and thanks to the presenters, very interesting. Yeah, I just wanted to ask this question. Um, I fully accept that, uh, that US and EU sanctions don't cover, uh, specifically don't cover Russian exports of food and fertilizer directly. But I think that probably what Putin was implying when he said that he would only reinstate the BSGI when uh, the restrictions on his exports, food and fertilizer exports are lifted, was that indirectly they, um, they're impacted by uh, sanctions such as financial, logistic, transport, et cetera, sanctions. And, uh, and, and this, the, the, the seven South African countries which have participated in the peace initiative issued a statement to, today, yesterday actually, in which they basically seem to concur with Putin that um, th those restrictions must should be lifted in order to enable the, the Grain Initiative to be reinstated. So would you please comment on that? Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter. I'll say two things. Um, the first is that um, those sanctions wouldn't exist had Putin not invaded a neighboring country for really no reason at all. So. Um, you know, the sanctions that Russia is experiencing today are a result of an unprovoked um, invasion of a neighbor, breaking all international laws and rules and, um, and wreaking destruction uh, on, on, a, uh, on a neighboring country. Um, the second thing I'd say is that, you know, Putin is trying to have it both ways. He says that um, their agricultural and fertilizer exports have been hindered um, by these indirect, um, well, he even says direct, which is not true, but even by these indirect um, constraints. And yet 
Russia has had record exports of agricultural products in the last two years. Last year was a record and he's on track for another record this year and also has continued to export fertilizer um, uh, to um, uh, an, a usual amount. And it really doesn't seem like these um, indirect uh, 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 problems are hindering them at all. He's also said that he's, you know, that Russia's ready to step in and replace the um, 33 million metric tons that went out through the Black Sea Grain Initiative last year. Um, how is how is Russia able to do that if they're facing all of these constraints that he claims? It, it just one of these uh, statements has to be false that they're facing constraints and they can't export versus we're ready to step in. And what you've seen is Russia is the main beneficiary of the destruction of Ukraine's breadbasket and the destruction of its export capabilities. It has picked up the 25% uh, decline of Ukrainian agricultural exports has literally been picked up by Russia. And it is benefiting from the higher prices and the market share that it is stealing from its neighbor as it blocks its ability to export. So. I just, it, it doesn't, Putin's um, statements just don't add up uh, when you look at the actual facts. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we have, I'd like to remind journalists to please raise their hand if they would like to ask a question live. Um, we have a question submitted in advance from Mr. Akin Obajeye from CNBC Africa in Nigeria who asks, uh, with Russia taking a stand not to renew the grain deal and its efforts to take African nations as allies through BRICS, what role can African leaders play in convincing Russia to renew the deal? And is the United States planning to lend a voice directly to that effort, looking at the global impact it is having on food security? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I think the fact that um, Secretary of State Blinken is at the UN today um, hosting a, a session on food security is testament to the United States lending its voice at the highest levels to, to this issue. Um, you know, we care enormously about global food security. We at USAID, it's as I said, it's it's core to what we do, but also the you know, government-wide, it's a priority. And um, you know, we encourage African countries to understand the facts, understand how the um, uh, invasion is um, hurting global food security, how it has uh, increased uh, global food prices, how um, Russia's destruction of um, Ukraine's agricultural sector will have ramifications, implications for years to come. Uh, you know, we, we've seen a um, uh, decline in, in the Ukrainian ability and capacities to export. Um, and um, we're going to have long-term higher prices as a result of that. And that affects the entire world. And as I've said earlier, it affects the most vulnerable countries the most. And so understanding the facts, looking at actually what is happening um, and lending African voices uh, to the call to uh, stop this um, uh, using this use of food as a weapon of war, I think is incredibly important. And of course, the United States, we are lending our voice to that in, in a multitude of different ways. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a follow-up question in our Q&A from uh, Kara Anna from Associated Press, Nairobi. Uh, as she asks, what is the U.S. doing to ensure that much more than 20% of the grain from Ukraine does directly goes directly to least developed countries? And what is the goal percentage? Um, thank you. I I don't know that we have a a a, a goal percentage. Um, I mean, I think that as I've said um, again and again, because. Um, commodity, food commodities are globally sourced and globally priced. Um, the reality is that when you take um, so many millions of metric tons off the market, I mean, last year through the Black Sea Grain Initiative, Ukraine exported 33 million metric tons, and it's going to be extraordinarily hard to replace that as 
Russia says that it can replace it, but you know the world is um, very dependent on all of the different agricultural breadbaskets being able to um, uh, operate at full capacity. And all you need is a drought or, um, or intense flooding or any of these um, natural disasters that we've seen in years past that have affected uh, markets such as Canada or Australia or uh, India, China, whatever, some of the big um, producers um, uh, around the world. And you will see a global food security, a global food price spike that, um, that no country in the world can ameliorate. Um, that is what happened in 2008. Um, and we are absolutely committed um, to not allowing that to happen again. And this weaponization of food is, um, it's immoral what um, Putin is doing. And um, it's a lie to say that, uh, that the food is not going um, to um, the neediest countries. 20% is a huge amount. Think if you took 20% of oil off the market, Think what would happen when you have 1% or 2% of oil come off the market, um, prices spike. And we shouldn't get overly focused on what percent is going to which countries. We know that Ukraine's food has long gone to countries in South Asia and in Africa. Um, the World Food Program, for example, while it's a small amount, it's an important amount of their humanitarian assistance. 80% of their wheat has been sourced from Ukraine. And when you look at Ukraine's big traditional markets in the Horn of Africa, in the Middle East, um, countries like Yemen and, and um, Lebanon, <clears throat> these are countries that have um, imported food from the Black Sea. And by shutting that down, they suffer and the whole world suffers. So let's not get too hung up on percentages, but recognize that uh, so much of Ukraine's uh, grains have gone to feed uh, developing countries around the world. But we will, as I said, we can provide um, the data that the UN itself has provided on a breakdown of where the food is going. Thank you. We have a question from Luke Anami uh, from the East African, a part of Nation Media Group in Nairobi. Yes, a pretty straightforward question. Russia has terminated the Black Sea Initiative, Black Sea Grain Initiative. What is your plan B in the distribution of grain to global markets? Well, I will um, let Aaron jump in uh, here, but just to say that from day one of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, we have um, been actively working on a plan B recognizing how critical Ukraine as a breadbasket is to the entire world and really trying to ensure that there are alternate routes for exporting Ukraine's grains. And we've done a lot overland uh, through Poland and, and, uh, and then through um, Southern Europe on the Danube, through those ports. Um, and we continue to invest in making those more productive um, and able to export more grains. As Erin mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, the Danube ports have gone from, from 3 million a month to, um, I'm sorry, 3 million a year to 3 million a month. Um, and, and that has, has helped, um, but right now it is not a replacement for the Black Sea, which is the most efficient and effective way to export um, bulk grains um, from Ukraine. Um, so, you know, it, it impacts pricing. Uh, but Aaron, why don't I let you talk a bit more specifically about how um, some of the uh, investments that we're making in the Danube ports and in the alternate routes are allowing for uh, continued um, exports from Ukraine. Sure, thank you. And, and thank you for the question. Um, it's not really a plan B, it's all of the above. And before the Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, was struck last summer. We were focused on, on supporting Ukrainian farmers to get their grain out and our EU uh, colleagues and allies uh, stepped up and, and as Deputy Coleman um, uh, described, the, the solidarity lanes came in, into play. We have increased th throughput by rail, by road and via the Danube. 
um, significantly. Of course, uh, we had to work uh, closely on both sides of the borders as well as um, uh, the downstream market uh, to ensure that, that the throughput, if you will, um, was maximized and, and made most efficient. Going forward with the announcement of our second phase of the Agricultural Resilience, Resilience Initiative, we are going to be expanding that throughput on those routes, but they will not be a replacement for the Black Sea ports first and foremost, Odessa. Um, and so it's not a solution, it's really um, uh, an, an interim um, alternative. And I will add on the economics that uh, those routes are far more costly to the farmers themselves. And so uh, when we were in Odessa speaking with a group of farmers, small farmers, uh, to, to ask them what the impact and effect both of the war and uh, the suspension of the initiative meant for them, uh, that it was very clear that it's going to translate into uh, reduced um, income, um, longer wait times. And so we're focused on um, interim expanding interim storage and a variety of other um, sort of response mechanisms, but it's not a long-term solution. The, the good news is that the farmers also said that you know this is their livelihood and they are committed not only to uh, ensure that they can plant the next harvest and and you know sort of live through uh, this these very trying economic times because they are committed not just to their own country but to helping contribute to food security around the world. Thank you. Um, we have time for one last question um, from Victoria Amunga from. VOA in Kenya, it's very straightforward in the chat. How much grain have you been able to transport out of Ukraine into which countries in Africa? Aaron, do you have the specifics on that? I don't, I think we're going to have to um, uh, follow up on the, the, with the data on, in addition to the other question that was asked. Yeah, I mean, the. Right. You know, we know that through the Black Sea Grain Initiative alone, it was 33 million metric tons um, while it lasted. Um, and uh, there was more grain exported through the Danube routes that we talked about and overland. Um, specifically, how much of all of that went to which countries we're going to have to follow up with. Great, thank you. Can I just, and, um, yeah, um, I'm sorry, Tiffany, there is a question. Um, in the chat about that I, sorry, I didn't get to read through them all, but Claire asked a question about uh, Putin's commitment to the six countries. I would just say that, um, uh, you know, sending grains to six countries, um, <clears throat> I'd like to see it happen <laughs> if it really does come to fruition. It's not a replacement. Um, you know, this is uh, small amounts of grain for uh, those specific countries. Um, and uh, it's just not a replacement for the world of, um, of taking one of the world's critical bread baskets off the market, which is literally what, what Putin is doing. Um, and it, it's just the, the idea that it's a, um, it somehow compensates for it. Um, yes, it might be of, you know, of benefit to those six specific countries, but um, it certainly is no replacement uh, for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's unfortunately all the time that we have today. I would like to ask uh, Deputy Administrator Coleman and Assistant Administrator McKee if they have any final words for our journalists. Um, I uh, just, uh, again, I'm, it's hard to read everything, but in the chat, I see there is a question about Ethiopia, and just to say that we are very focused on restarting our food distributions in Ethiopia as soon as possible. Um, and we are working closely with the government of Ethiopia to ensure that as soon as possible that we are able to do that. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad you took that question. I didn't I want to have to squeeze it in. I wasn't sure of your time, so I appreciate you responding. Um, do either of you have closing remarks before we before we finish? Um, I, I would just um, again thank you all uh, for joining us here. Um, there there is um, a fair amount of fake news on this topic around the world of what's actually happening um, 
And there is, as, as I have noted, um, just a, a blatant discrepancy in what Putin says on the one hand that um, somehow Russia has been hurt um, by its inability to export its uh, grains because of sanctions. Agriculture, fertilizer, they are not sanctioned. Um, if there are secondary effects, they don't seem to be making um, it too difficult uh, for Russia, which has had record agricultural exports. This is really about one country destroying a breadbasket in another. And the long-term global repercussions of that um, have yet to be felt, um, but we are looking at many, many years of, uh, uh, of effort to uh, get Ukraine's capacity back to where it was. Um, and the longer that um, its farmers are unable to export their goods, and the more destruction that um, Putin's government reigns on the Black Sea uh, infrastructure, agricultural in infrastructure of Ukraine, uh, the harder it is uh, going to be and the worse um, the impact will be on the entire world. And it will be felt most by developing countries and the least developed countries, which are most dependent on importing uh, food. So I just want you to all keep that in mind and also keep in mind that uh, global grains are globally sourced and globally priced. And um, this is not um, uh, something that um, will uh, be easy to, to just turn back on uh, because of the long-term destruction that is being um, inflicted on Ukrainian agriculture and Ukrainian farmers. Thank you. Assistant Administrator McKee, do you have any final words? No, no, Isabel uh, captured it very well. I just want to thank everybody again for the time you spent to pose questions and listen to us. And, and we are dedicated to do all that we can to help Ukraine continue to contribute what it's what is possible by, uh, as I said, the, the solidarity lanes and other interim solutions, uh, because it's vital for all the reasons that Deputy Coleman cited, and we will do so for as long as it takes. And we appreciate your help in uh, understanding both the economics and the challenges. And um, as as journalists and a, and a critical pillar of democracy, helping make sure that the facts get out. Um, to your uh, readers, listeners, and constituents. Um, and we stand ready to help to provide the numbers that you asked for and are deeply appreciative of the time. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes today's briefing. I would like to thank USAID's Deputy Administrator for Policy and Programming, Isabel Coleman, and Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Europe and Eurasia, Erin Elizabeth McKee, for speaking to us today and all of our journalists for participating. If you have any questions about today's briefing, you may contact the Africa Regional Media Hub at afmediahub at state.gov. Thank you.